Hey there, folks. Before we get into our brand new episode of Build the Roster, I've got a question. Do you like fighting games? Do you like watching someone really bad at fighting games struggle to play them for a week straight? What if I said it was for charity? Hey, there we go. Yes, it's time for our second annual Fight for the Future charity stream. Last year, we did a week-long stream over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Professor Thorgy to raise money to buy medical supplies for doctors in the midst of the pandemic, and this year, we're doing it again. Starting on July 19th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and going for a week straight, 9 to 10 hours every single day, I will be playing fighting games to help raise money for Doctors Without Borders. We'll be announcing the full lineup of games soon, but I can tell you right now, we have got a lot on this year's schedule. Like, 80 games. It's going to be a doozy. So, make sure to stay tuned here, or follow us on Twitter at Thorgy's Arcade to get the full announcement. And if you missed out on last year's stream, we're uploading the whole thing right now over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Professor Thorgy. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's get on with the main attraction and talk about people with crazy hair and giant belts fighting each other. You know, business as usual here on Build the Roster. Folks, this is a special time of the year. The days are longer, grills are being sparked up, the beach is open and just ready for once in a lifetime memories to be made and we will not be taking part in any of that because Guilty Gear is back, baby! Yes, the latest installment in one of the biggest and craziest fighting game franchises is finally here and I can't tell you how excited I am. I have loved Guilty Gear ever since the early 2000s when I picked up on a whim a copy of X2 Reload. I knew nothing about this series, but it instantly won me over with its quick combat, stylish sprite work, and most importantly, the characters, world, and music that were just overflowing with personality. Since then, I've eagerly awaited each new installment in this series, and this month, Guilty Gear Strive has finally released, and I am obsessed with it. But you know, things weren't always this good for the Guilty Gear fans. No, you see, a couple years ago, Arc Systems actually lost the rights to their flagship series, and they needed something new to fill that giant, edgy anime fighter hole in our hearts. And so they created Blaze Blue, and I remember when a friend of mine was the first in our group to buy a PS3, we all head over to his place to check it out, and he popped in a copy of Blaze Blue. And after one round of seeing these characters and feeling these buttons, we all agreed on one thing. These characters needed to cross over with Guilty Gear. And we weren't the only ones to think that at the time. It almost felt like fate that these two would one day cross over. They had the same over-the-top anime aesthetics, quick gameplay, iconic insta-kills, mountains of lore that made zero sense to us in the pre-Wikipedia days. Hell, the team that worked on Guilty Gear was called Team Red, and the team that worked on Blaze Blue was called Team Blue. If the internet has taught me anything, it's that those two colors do not get along and are destined to fight. And I remember as soon as Arc Systems got the rights to Guilty Gear back, they returned with Guilty Gear XR's sign, and seeing these two franchises now being released side by side stoked the fires of friendly competition in a way that we have not seen since the great Street Fighter Mortal Kombat debates of the 90s. I'm going to have to do that crossover someday too, aren't I? But despite these cries for a crossover, we never even got a whiff of them together. Never even saw some promo art of the characters staying together. Not even a blurry photo of a pitch right on a sticky note in a writer's room somewhere. Nothing. Even when Blaze Blue got their own crossover game, a crossover game that pulled in almost every single fighting franchise Arc Systems had ever touched, Persona Arena, Under Night and Birth, Arcana Heart, the only fighter franchise not to appear was Guilty Gear. We got the freaking tank from Akatsuki Blitzkamp, a game 90% of you didn't even know was a thing until I said it right now but we couldn't get Soul Bad Guy and Ragnar the Blood Edge to do the Ryu Cyclops handshake? Apparently that was asking too much? Well, screw it. Guilty Gear is back. The whole world is talking about it. It's selling better than any Guilty Gear game ever. So today on Build a Roster, we're going to cross these worlds together to create the craziest, most over-the-top, hypest anime fighter ever. And considering these are both Arc System properties, I can only assume it will also have the most insane versus screen of all time. Heaven or hell, you one, let's rock! The wheel of fate is turning. 
Fast Can't escape from crossing fate. Fight! Yeah, that's the stuff. Now, as always, we have to start by figuring out how many characters to include. I'll try not to make this overly complicated, but there is a lot to consider here. First off, it's a crossover game, so the roster has to be pretty big to include a good variety of characters from both sides. We need to get a combination of old classics, new faces, a variety of playstyles, and we need that for both teams. However, this would be the first crossover between both franchises, and the first crossover in a series always tends to have the smallest roster simply because the first game has the most that you have to establish in terms of gameplay, and you have the least number of pre-existing resources to pull from. Now I feel like for the first time that two series have crossed over, 20 feels decent. You don't want to dip below double digits for either side. But at the same time, if you have a new game out for one of these series, you don't want either side to go larger than the starting roster of that game. I mean, part of the purpose of a crossover game is to promote the series in question, and if series A has new game B out, but crossover game C has more characters from series A than new game B, then why would people buy new game B when they can get crossover game C and have more characters from series A? Remember when I said I wasn't going to make this overly complicated? What the hell was I thinking? Point is, Guilty Gear has a new game out with a starting roster of 15 characters, so for Blades Blue Cross Guilty Gear, we need to have fewer than that on each side, so that means that we need to have more than 10, but less than 15, which comes out to 12 and a half, damn it. Well, that means that we're now going to have to decide between 12 or 13 on each side, and in my heart of hearts, I know that Arc Systems normally has small starting rosters, so I know that they would go with 12. But at the time of this recording, Guilty Gear Strive is selling incredibly well. They just announced that in its first week, it already sold three times what its last game sold in its entire lifetime, and Steam reports that at launch, it had more people playing it than Mortal Kombat 11, Street Fighter 5, and Tekken 7 did in their entire lifespans. That is huge. And since that game is so new, we would be able to reuse a ton of assets from it in here. So you know what? If I was put in charge, and this is the game that I had to design, I would throw that newfound popularity and cash around and give us up to 13 on each side for a total of 26. So now that that's out of the way, there's one other thing that I want to cover before we get to the actual roster. Normally we never talk about how these games would play because typically we cover sequels to existing franchises, but this crossover game would be the first of its kind. So I'm sure that someone out there is wondering how we would combine the playstyles of Guilty Gear and Blazeblue. So for that one person out there, let's tackle that real quick. They would actually fit together pretty well. You see, Guilty Gear has four basic attacks, Punch, Kick, Slash, and Heavy Slash, while Blaze Blue has three basic attacks, Light, Medium, and Hard. So for this game, we would use the four buttons of Guilty Gear and make each Blaze Blue character's Light, Medium, and Heavy match up with the Punch, Slash, and Heavy Slash button while giving each Blaze Blue character a brand new kick attack. Unless, of course, their Light attack was already a kick, then we would give them a brand new Punch attack. As for the unique mechanics to include, from Guilty Gear, I would take the Roman Cancels, which are ways to cancel an action to reset a combo and slow down your opponent if you time it just right, and the Dust Attacks, a fifth attack which acts as a universal overhead that can send your opponents flying. And from Blaze Blue, I would include their Drive Actions, which are unique actions for every single character that can range from a special attack to charging up a meter. So, in other words, this would basically be a six-button game, with each character having a punch, kick, slash, and heavy slash, as well as a dust attack and a drive button, and you could press certain buttons together to pull off the Roman cancels. I know Blaze Blue also has an overdrive state that temporarily enhances your character, but I feel like that's one mechanic too many. It was either that or the Roman cancels, and we're not getting rid of the Roman cancels. And of course, we would keep the instant kills that these games are known for, but we would try to find a common ground between the executions in each game. In both games, you can only use the instant kills in the final round, but in Guilty Gear, you can activate it at any time as long as you're willing to give up your super meter. In Blaze Blue, you have to have your super meter full, and you can only use it if your opponent is below a certain life total. So I say for this crossover game, your super meter will still have to be full to activate the insta kill, but your opponent's life total will no longer matter. As long as you've got full meter, you can activate it at any time. I feel like this takes the freedom of Guilty Gear's instant kills and restrictions of Blaze Blues and finds a nice balance between the two. Again, normally we don't cover how these hypothetical games would play, but it is shocking how easy it would be for these mechanics to merge. Almost like it was destined to happen. Just throwing that out there into the universe and hoping that something comes from it. 
But all right, now that that's all the way, it's time for what we came here for. It is time to build that roster. So let's go ahead and start with the most obvious choice, or should I say, choices. Mankind knew that they cannot change society. So instead of reflecting on themselves, they blamed the beasts, heaven or hell. Come on, brother. Point your blade at me. You again, Jin? I'm going to give this my all. You ready? Then I don't need to hold back. Saul versus Kai. I am late. Are you ready? You're about to find out. So, Ragna, Kai, and Jean. Yeah, normally we wouldn't do multiple character reveals all at once, but let's be real. All of you knew these were coming. There is zero tension behind this reveal because the moment you hear Blaze Blue Cross go to gear, these are the faces you picture. Hell, this is the box art right here. You walk into the store, this is the poster that you see hanging up there promoting the game telling you to pre-order it now. And for good reason! You've got a red-clad, gruff, loner, anti-hero protagonist whose origin is tied into the backstory of the world, and their blue and white-clad blonde rival who works for the top law enforcement agency of the game. I'd say that about 75% of the reason why everyone wants these games to cross over is because of these four characters right here. Oh, they've even got some pretty good personalities and backgrounds that would be great to see clash with each other in either the story mode or in the in-game dialogue. Soul Bad Guy is a bounty hunter, Ragnar the Blood Edge is an outlaw with a cartoonishly high price on his head. Their initial exchange and reason for fighting writes itself. And Kai Keith and Jin Kisaragi might both be lawmen and soldiers of sorts, However, Kai has often gone against the people he works for because he wants to reach out to Gears and cares about others, while Jin is almost of the lawful evil alignment. He's cold-blooded and borderline sociopathic at times. So this is a great example of how characters from these two franchises can have so much in common that they deserve to pair up, but still have so much that separates them that would be a perfect excuse for them to fight. And I'll go ahead and let you know right now, that's kind of the philosophy for the rest of this roster. As I said, I want to get the classics, I want to get the newer faces, I want to get the weird obscure grabs, and I want a variety in playstyles, but I also want to grab characters who would be perfect matchups for each other either in playstyle or in terms of personalities that could bounce off each other. And man, it is shocking how many more perfect pairings there are between these series. Now before we move on from these four, as I said in this game, all Blaze Blue characters would get a kick and dust attack, but Guilty Gear characters would now have some kind of a drive ability. What I'm picturing for Kai is that his drive would be a short animation where he charges his sword with electricity, and for a limited amount of time, his slash and heavy slash attack would inflict the opponent with a shock stats that would cause them to move slower. In previous games, that stats would be tied to special moves that Kai had, so now we would be tying it to the drive ability. And as for Soul? Well, in Stride, they took away his dragon install super that would put him into a charge state for a period of time, so I say that we make his drive a sort of taunt, and each time that you perform it, you fill up a little mirror. Once you have pulled off the taunt five times, he would then go in his dragon install form. If you play Dragon Ball Fighters, think of it being like Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta's taunt that charges up his instant kill, which is another Arc Systems game, which means that this company already knows how to pull off an ability like this. Now, I know some people might think that's too much of a downside to have to perform this so many times in order to unlock his dragon install, but remember, this would no longer be a super move. So if you managed to pull this off, you wouldn't spend any meter on it. Meaning, you could go into his form and still have full bar allowing you to do crazy damage. But okay, as I said, those are the four most obvious choices for this roster. They're the ones you put in the big reveal trailer. They're the ones literally all of us saw coming. So now is when the show really begins. Now is when we have to start making some tough choices. The Wheel of Fate is turning! Noel Vermillion. 
Okay, maybe they're not that tough just yet. Yeah, while Guilty Gear really only has two main faces in Soul and Kai, Noelle has always been the third part of the Blaze Blue franchise, so we need to include her. Now, in case you don't know the history and lore of Blaze Blue, I'm not going to get into Noelle's whole backstory because it is indeed long and super complicated. Unlike the rest of Blaze Blue, which I'm sure is a straightforward and easy read. But essentially, Noelle was this young girl who worked under Jin and was tasked with bringing in Ragna, and she just happens to look exactly like their long dead sister. So yeah, there is a reason she is often depicted as the third face of this franchise. She's the string that ties Ragna and Jin together. But that's not the only reason to include her. She's also got a super unique playstyle. She uses guns as her primary weapon, but not necessarily for projectiles. Instead, each time that she does a basic attack, a burst appears out of the tip of her gun, which can give her some pretty decent medium-sized range. She can also form little spheres of damage around the stage, which gives her some decent range without just using basic projectiles. And that might sound like she's a character who takes lots of pain and experimenting to get used to, but she's actually a great character for new players as well, as she has a drive ability where essentially her guns fight for her, and she can now start doing auto combos and everything strings together, making her a great character for anyone to pick up. Now, as for who her Guilty Gear counterpart would be, Noelle is a very sweet young girl who, as I said, helps to tie the two main rivals of the series together, but she's also got a bit of a secret to her as she is an artificial creation with overwhelming power. So her Guilty Gear counterpart has to be... Here comes Daredevil! Dizzy. Dizzy checks off a lot of different boxes for this roster. Major character important to the franchise? Yep, she was the big focal point of the Guilty Gear X games. Is she a fan favorite? Oh, heck yeah, people love Dizzy, and she's high on the list of characters that people want as DLC in Strive at the moment. So in case she doesn't end up making it into that game, we can put her in here to make those fans happy enough to perk up and pay attention. And one other checkbox worth mentioning, this is the meeting of the two biggest Arc Systems franchises around. So we want to show off what makes Arc System special, and their fighting games are always gorgeous. And I think Dizzy might be one of the best animated characters in Guilty Gear history. She's got a literal angel and devil on her shoulders that do the fighting for her, and just look at the details in their animation. Seriously, the amount of personality that is put into every single one of their actions is stunning and has led to some of the best special moves and insta-kills in the entire series. And when it comes to how she could fit the dynamic between the characters, she is a perfect match for Noelle. First, they're both powerful, extraordinary beings who are actually just sweet and wholesome young girls. Give us a scene in the story mode where Noelle transforms into her Mu-12 form and she goes head-to-head -head with Dizzy? That is a scene that justifies both of them being included in here all by itself. Also, as I said, you know you have to have a scene of Ragna and Jin across from Soul and Kai. Well, since Noelle is very much the third part of the Jin and Ragna team, if Soul and Kai need a third, Dizzy just makes sense. She's Kai's wife and Soul's... kinda daughter? やめ。いいか。今から皆何も考えるな。待ってくれ。ま、そうか。その話はディズイはジャスティスの娘で、つまり yeah, it's complicated. Anyway, point is, the three of them do have some pretty strong ties between themselves and makes Dizzy check off almost all the same boxes that Noelle does. Now, speaking of characters to include because of their playstyles, there is one style of fire that we have to check off now before it's too late. Here comes Daredevil! Potemkin. Every fighting game needs a grappler, whether it be the slowest mythological mainstream entry or the nichest craziest anime fighter, 
you need to make sure there's at least one grappler. And Potemkin isn't just a grappler, he's the grappler. He's got big giant hands and if he gets close to you, he's going to grab you and send you into space. When this man goes to a job interview, he fills out a grapplication. When he takes the family out to eat, he goes to grapple bees. His favorite fruity beverage is a grapple. His, I'm sorry, I'm bad at making puns and I'm just trying to stall because there really isn't a whole lot that needs to be said here. We need a grappler, and while miniseries out there will make sure to include multiple grappler characters for variety, Guilty Gear really only has the one. Because that's all you need. This man literally bodies the planet. You don't need anyone else. And as for his drivability, I say make it some kind of a stance that he can go into that gives him armor. He wouldn't attack while he's in this stance, but most of Potemkin's moves have long starve and inputs, making them hard to get out, especially considering that he can't run or dash. Well, just have him go into this stance, then as the opponent attacks you, you input your very next command, bam! You can now execute that move uninterrupted and they're already right there in your face to receive the damage. Sure, you would take damage as well if they attack you while you're in this stance, it is a big risk reward type of ability, but that's what Potemkin is. He's a character made up entirely of huge advantages and disadvantages. So alright, we got the big grappler of this game out of the way, right? Well, we got the grappler out of the way for Guilty Gear's side. If this is a crossover game, you can't just give one side a grappler, you need to make sure that the other side has one too. And for Blaze Blue, the choice is obvious. The Wheel of Fate is turning! Iron Taker. Yep, when it comes to the grappler on the Blaze Blue side, again, just like with Guilty Gear, it's kind of obvious. Blaze Blue has a few characters who have grappler tendencies and techniques, but if you want pure, uncut, grade A grappler beef, it has to be Iron Taker. And honestly, even if there was a better grappler on the Guilty Gear side, I'd still probably go with Taker because, again, you want to think about which characters would match up nicely in a crossover, which ones would have the best interactions. And if Guilty Gear side gets a giant mechanized grappler, and Blaze Blue's resident grappler is also a mountain of bolts and electricity, how on earth can you not put them up against each other? I kept saying that Ragna and Jin going up against Soul and Kai is what you put in the reveal trailer, but you better believe in the big crazy anime opening cutscene for this game, there is going to be a shot of Potemkin and Tager clashing their giant hands into each other and pushing against one another as electricity crackles around them and the earth shakes. I mean, even if you aren't a fan of either of these characters, you just look at them and you have to agree, yeah, yeah, that is something that has to happen in this game. Hell, they both even have big ultimate attacks where they fly the opponent into the air before smashing them down into the earth. Have a scene in the story mode where Tager leaps Potemkin into the air, only for Potemkin to turn around, grab him in midair, then rocket blast even higher until eventually the two of them end up pile driving each other into the earth from outer space. We have the potential to make one of the most epic pile drivers in video game history happen. You better believe we're going to take it. Here comes Daredevil. Sanjou. Chip Zanif. Okay, we got the big beefy brutes out of the way, time to swing to the other side of the spectrum and cover the rushdown characters. Yes, you need those speedy characters that know how to apply pressure, and since this is an anime fighter, speed is kind of the name of the game. Now, when it comes to grapplers, Guilty Gear only has a few to choose from, but they have a healthy chunk of rushdown. So it was hard choosing which one to include. But in the end, I decided to go with Chip, because not only has he been in this game since the very beginning and continued to be in every installment since, but also, he's just a great character. He's the ninja president of his own country. How can you not love that? But if I can be honest with everyone, the other reason I chose him is because in his latest appearance in Guilty Gear Strive, man, they did him kind of dirty. By the time this video comes out, who knows what kind of adjustments could have been made, but at the moment, Chip is almost a running gag on social media because his health bar is 
paper thin. But when you put a crossover game together, you have to merge two different game styles and statistics, meaning it's the perfect opportunity to rebalance characters that need rebalancing. So let's put Chip in here and give him some tweaks to make his fans happy. And as for who Chip's Blaze Blue counterpoint would be, I'm actually not going to worry about playstyles and instead focus on personality. Because Chip is a ninja who leads his own group of people. Can you Blaze Blue fans think of anyone that happens to match that description? The Wheel of Fate is turning! Friendship, determination, victory! I am the ninja who fights in the name of love and justice. Bang Shishigami! Bang Shishigami! Yes, if Blaze Blue gets a ninja overflowing with bombastic personality, then Blaze Blue gets one too. And I'll admit I kind of want him in here simply because I think the interactions between him and Chip would be fantastic. But even beyond that, Bang is just a super fun character all around. This is a guy who is basically the ninja version of a common rider, and when he activates his distortion drive, not only does his speed increase, but he has his own theme song that suddenly starts playing. Quicker than the wind and as still as the forest! Hotter than flames and more magnificent than a mountain! Oh my gosh, I won't look at the answer! I don't even think I need to say anything else. I'm stalling him. What more do you need? Well, if you do need another reason to include Bang, lucky for you, I have one. Blaze Blue already had their own big crossover game, Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, and a massive chunk of the Blaze Blue universe was already included in that game. So, I wanted to make sure that this game featured at least a few characters that didn't make it into Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle in order to give them a chance in the spotlight, and Bang to me is one of the bigger faces of this series who was left absent from there. So now we can put him in here and he'll finally have a chance to shine like the big superhero that he is. Or at least the big superhero that he really wants to be. The Wheel of Fate is turning! It's time for the punishment! <laughs> Please just die for me! Hazama. Alright, if we're bringing together the biggest faces of this series, then you can't just bring together the heroes, you need to bring on the bad guys as well. And when it comes to Blaze Blue, oh boy, this was a tough choice between Hazama and Yuki Terami, mostly because the two of them are kind of one and the same. Yeah, how can I explain this clearly? Um, let's just say that Blaze Blue sometimes likes to get a little kingdom heartsy with its plot. And if the Blaze Blue fans think that's an unfair comparison, I'd like to remind you, all of these characters are kind of the same person. What the hell are you talking about? But basically, Hazuma was a vessel created for this legendary psychopathic spirit, Yuki Terumi. And Terumi is the true big bad guy of the whole series. But Hazuma, does have his own distinct personality, and the two of them have been playable as separate characters with different moves in the same games, so I had to choose one of them. And even though Yuki was the true mastermind behind all of this, when you do a crossover game, you want to think about who is the more iconic character in the franchise. And I would argue that Hazuma just screams Blaze Blue. This guy's snake-like smile has been splattered all over this series since day one, and I would say that when most people picture Blaze Blue bad guy, this face pops into their head first. Plus, as I said, he was a vessel that contained Yuki, so if we put Hazuma in here, it's kind of a two-for-one deal. We would still be able to get Yuki Terumi into the story, they would still be basically the same guy, all I'm talking about now is just which model do we end up including? What moveset do we include in the game? So that's why I'm going with Hazma. I think this dude's smooth criminal attire just fits the role better. But I'm also picking him because I think he fits very nicely alongside Guilty Gear's big recurring threat. Here comes Daredevil! Mankind knew that they cannot change society. So instead of reflecting on themselves, they blamed the beasts. Heaven or hell? Eno. 
Again, I'm sure that a lot of people out there, when they think of the big villain of Guilty Gear series, their mind is going to automatically go to that man. But that man, at the time of this recording, has yet to be playable in the actual series. And I do want to stress, yet. I mean, we all know he's coming, right? I know how bad my timing is. He'll probably be playable as soon as this video goes up. But at the moment, that man still hasn't been playable in the main Guilty Gear franchise, so I don't really think his first playable appearance should be in the crossover game. Also, in case you can't tell, I really like saying that man. So if we want a recurring villain who is iconic to the series, it's gotta be Eno. The witch attire, the rock and roll motif, the foul mouth that can make a sailor blush. I might thought of well, there goes the monetization for this video. Point is, Eno is a huge personality for this series, and one of her big driving motivations is that she came from a world where the future was bleak and gray, so she wants to make sure that that doesn't come to be because she doesn't want to be bored. Well, Hazuma is a sociopath who enjoys hurting others because he himself can't feel pain. In other words, they're both malicious monsters just looking for stimulation. I can totally see them fighting only to then look at each other and say, you know what? I get you. I understand what you're about. Let's work together. Heck, both of them even have experience being the right hand to the big true master manipulator of the whole series. It really does line up pretty well. And as for her drive ability, have her rock out on her guitar as you hold down the drive button in order to charge up her next projectile. I always loved her rocker persona and having her rock out on her guitar as her drive action would be a great way to play into that. Here comes Daredevil! Yes, we had to include the little dolphin demon herself. Mei has been a major part of the Guilty Gear series since the very first installment and has remained a fan favorite character in almost every single game. And again, maybe they've rebalanced things since writing this script, but at the moment, she is a beast in Strive, with an arsenal of flying dolphins that can drive grown men insane. Start using the f***ing dolphins! All she does is dolphin! She rushes in and you can't get out! Plus, out of all the Guilty Gear characters, May to me just feels like she fits the tone of Blaze Blue more than any of them. Because Blaze Blue, yeah, it's got your edgy sword boys, it's got your weird creepy critters, it's got your angsty RPG protagonists, but it's also got a ton of young, cutesy anime girls. Guilty Gear, yeah, not so much. They kind of just have May. So if we want to have a character in here from Guilty Gear that fits this particular side of the Blaze Blue universe, it has to be the character who summons out cartoony sea life to fight beside her. The wheel of fate is turning. Sucks to be you. Yes. Await it. Nothing. Yes. Finish. Makoto Nanaya, from a character who uses adorable animal partners to a character who is an adorable animal partner. Okay, that's not an entirely fair summation, but we're halfway through this list and coming up with segues is starting to become harder. Yes, I'm picking Makoto because not only is she a very popular character in the Blaze Blue series, but also I think she is just insanely fun. She's got this big bubbly personality and she's a squirrel girl who is quite possibly unbeatable. She rains down flurries of punches on the enemies and can even hit someone into the moon. You put all that together and it makes someone who I want in a fighting game. Plus, I kinda love that both her and Mei, while being upbeat, super friendly young characters, are both insanely strong. It's another thing that would be great to see come up in the story mode. Like we see someone shocked that Mei can lift up that giant anchor, but then they're double shocked when Makoto can lift it up just fine as well. Just as a fun little gag, little stuff like that makes crossover special. All right, so far a lot of these characters have been pretty standard. The characters that you would expect to see in a crossover between these franchises. We need a character that hasn't been seen in a while. Someone that will make audiences perk up and pay attention. So for this next character, I present you with... Here comes Daredevil! <laughs> Heaven or hell, duel one, let's rock! Testament. 
Testament was the mid-boss in the first Guilty Gear game, and returned for Guilty Gear X as another powerhouse that was important to the plot. And that was kind of it. It's been almost 20 years since he last popped up, and anytime I see the Guilty Gear devs ask people, who do you want to see return, I always see him way up there. But I can understand why they haven't returned. Guilty Gear is a very story-driven game. Meaning, if the character doesn't fit the story, then they probably won't be in here. And the last time that we saw a testament, he basically said, Screw humanity, I'm going out into the forest forever. And has remained there ever since. But this is a crossover game. We can craft whatever story we need in order to bring these characters in. The whole point of a crossover game is fan service. So if people have been asking for 20 years to see this character return, let's make that happen. And speaking mechanically, he would be a great fit for this game. Again, Guilty Gear characters are going to get drive abilities in here, and Testament already has a crow familiar that can attack the opponent, he sets up traps, he summons out little monsters to fight beside him. There are so many things that we could assign to the drive button. Plus, if you need any more motivation to include him in this game, his design is based on the Grim Reaper. Ragnar's nickname is literally the Grim Reaper. This is another fight that has to happen in the story mode. The Wheel of Fate is turning! New 13. Again, part billionaire roster is making sure that you represent each type of fighter, and if you look up Zoner in the dictionary, there is a picture of New 13. When you absolutely, positively have to hit everything on the field without actually moving, you pick New 13. And while she doesn't fit the same quota as Testament, that being a character who hasn't appeared in a while, no character really fits that in Blaze Blue because one of the great things about Blaze Blue is they keep bringing everyone back for every installment. However, just like Testament, she was a big deal early on in the franchise. She was actually the original boss of the series. But as I said, the great thing about Blaze Blue is that everyone gets to return, which means she didn't fade away. She continued to play into the story and be a memorable character for every single installment. And you might be thinking, yeah, but there has to be a better matchup for Testament. The fact that they both used to be bosses or mid-bosses is a bit of a stretch. True, but honestly, we're about halfway through this list right now. I think we've got enough characters in here based around the idea of matchups. Now we can start looking specifically at fan favorites, important characters, and interesting playstyles. And speaking of interesting playstyles, here, here comes Daredevil! We must operate now! Do not worry. I don't need your insurance! Faust. Okay, listen, I could go on and on about how Faust is an iconic character for Guilty Gear, how everyone sees that big bag on his head and they instantly think of Guilty Gear. So much so that he's one of the only Guilty Gear characters to have ever actually crossed over into other games. And I could go on about how Faust's playstyle is pure chaos and games of chance, which makes him completely unique from every other character we could possibly include, adding a ton of spice to this giant roster gumbo that we're cooking up, but none of that matters. Because the reason why Faust has to make it into this roster is because Faust is Mr. YouTube Compilation Video. Faust is known for having crazy over-the-top supers and insta-kills that leave every enemy with some kind of bizarre comedic reaction, and if he now crosses over with a new franchise, that is a whole world full of characters that have never had a chance to have their faces twisted into hilarious contortions, and you know the internet would eat that up. They would put together in a second an every Faust insta-kill reaction video, and that, my friends, is what we in the marketing department like to call free advertising. The Wheel of Fate is turning! Nine, the Phantom. Speaking of characters with interesting playstyles, I describe Faust's playstyle as chaotic variety, and Nine the Phantom is controlled variety. 
Blaze Blue is a game low with characters with unique playstyles, and I know this is a very biased opinion, but Nine is one of my favorite playstyles of any fighting game character I have ever seen. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean I'm good with her. No, remember the motto of Thorgy's Arcade. We love fighting games, even though we're bad at them. But if you don't know Nine, she's got elemental attacks mapped to each of her three basic attacks, fire, water, and wind. But each time that you use one of these attacks, it then charges up a stock for that element. It stores that stock for the last three moves that you performed, and then you can hit your drive button to do an attack that is based upon what stock you have stored up. I think this is genius, and considering that this game would give each of the Blaze Blue characters a fourth attack with the kick button, that means that she would now have a fourth elemental attack that would create so many new drive combinations. Yeah, she's popular, and that witch design is great, and because of that, it would be fun to see her fight or team up with Eno, but her drive is literally crafting a witch's brew out of the ingredients that you have built up over your fight. That is insanely cool, and if we're putting together a roster full of variety, Nine is all about that. The Wheel of Fate is turning! Celica Celica Mercury. Speaking of Nine the Phantom, I'm going to include her sister Celica. The reason I'm picking her is because Blaze Blue has a decent number of characters that fight with Puppet, so I figure if we want to get a good representation of this world to introduce new fans to the series, we should include at least one of them in here. And out of all the Puppet fighters, I know that Celica probably uses her Puppet the least. In fact, ironically, she is the only one from that game I would argue in fighting game terminology doesn't even count as a Puppet fighter but she is definitely the most popular among them, and her powers don't stop at just her puppet. She actually has healing powers which would help her stand out even more. Just like with her sister Nine the Phantom, you want to include characters that will make people who have never touched Blaze Blue say, wait, you can do what in that game? Oh, I need to learn more about this. And something tells me seeing Celica fully heal her opponent before her doll gives them a massive beating would raise just the right number of questions. Here comes Daredevil! Zato 1. Blaze Blue might be known for having a decent chunk of puppet fighters, but Zato 1 is the king of Arxis puppet fighters. His little black Tolly, not the Venom symbiote partner Eddie, has always kept his opponent guessing as he crawls about the stage to attack, and in Guilty Gear Strive, he can do so much that they might as well just be two characters in one. So to all those Blaze Blue players who specialized in Carl or Relius or are upset that the one puppet fighter we are including is the one that doesn't really quite count as a puppet fighter, this is your opportunity to try someone on the other team and see what you think. And considering that all the Guilty Gear characters are now gaining drive abilities, Zato is a perfect choice because the amount of abilities you could give Eddie are limited only by your imagination. Have him pop out of the screen from different directions. Have him stay where he is and attack whoever is around him like a turret. Have him bond with Zato for a power boost at the loss of some of your moves. There are so many things that you could do for this character with the new drive ability. The Wheel of Fate is turning! I am the cold steel. I am the just sword. With blade in hand, shall I reap the sins of this world and cleanse it in the fires of destruction? I am Hakuman. The end has come. Hakuman. This is another character that checks off a lot of boxes. For starters, they're a classic. They were in the original Blaze Blue, and not as a small footnote, no, they were a major player, almost like a mid boss who tied heavily into the plot which is another major reason to include him in this game. Again, you know there's going to be some kind of a crazy story mode in here. Both these franchises always set aside a huge chunk of their resources for their story, so if they came together, you know there would be a big story mode. Heck, we would probably even get branching pathways and a true ending and a gag reel at the end of this. They will go in hard on this story mode. And I'm not going to go too deep into Hagerman's backstory because... 
well, if I did that for everyone, then you would be watching this video until the next Builder roster came out. But long story short, Blaze Blue is a world that keeps getting destroyed and resetting itself, and Hakuman is a character who survived the previous collapsing timeline, so if Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue came together, you know there would be some kind of cross time and dimensional mischief going on. So the guy who can literally survive the death of a timeline might have some special interest in all of this. Plus, Eno also came from an alternate reality that ceased to be and is a time traveler. I can already see the two of them having some unique interactions. And when it comes to gameplay, Hakuman is known for his giant sword. And when it comes to Guilty Gear, there is no shortage of characters to match him up with. Heck, I've still got like three more on this list coming up, including this one. Here comes Daredevil! Ramlethal Valentine. Ramlethal is another unique character with a lot going for her playstyle. Sure, she's got the giant swords, but these are no ordinary giant swords. They're the size of pillars, and she can have them act independently of her when she throws them out, which almost gives her a dash a puppet fighter. In other words, Ramlethal would play... well, like Ramlethal. There's really no other character out there that feels like her, so she would be another great character to really show off the range of this cast. In fact, we could spice her gameplay up even more with her new drive ability. Normally, after she throws her swords out, she can have them either explode or slash in a few directions. So, let's give these swords a brand new attack after she throws them out and have it be linked directly to the drive button. But beyond her playstyle, I would argue that Ramlethal is probably one of the biggest recent additions to the Guilty Gear universe. When the series moved to 2.5D graphics, she was the big boss of that game, and since then, I'd say she's remained one of the big faces of this generation of Guilty Gear. So, if we want someone to represent the past four games, she's more than earned that spot. And again, when it comes to whatever this story might be, both Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear have plots that center heavily around another world made up entirely of information and magic. In Blaze Blue, it's the boundary. In Guilty Gear, it's the backyard. And it's even said in Blaze Blue that the boundary connects to other dimensions, so we can just say that the reason these worlds are crossing over is because the boundary and the backyard are connected. That is just way too easy to not do something with it. And Ramlethal comes from the backyard. That's where she was created. So if we're going to grab this incredibly low-hanging fruit to explain this plot, we should probably include a character who comes from the big Deus Ex Machina dimension. The Wheel of Fate is turning! Like dirt. But dirt, I'm sure, has better manners. Rachel Alucard. Speaking of characters who send giant props all over the screen, let's also throw the mysterious immortal vampire Rachel into the mix. For story purposes, Rachel has always been that character who clearly knows more than she's laying on, so when worlds are colliding, you need someone that can pop up, say something ominous, then leave as everyone wonders what the hell they were talking about. And gameplay-wise, again, very unique character. I know I've said that a lot so far this episode, but it's true. Both Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear are two franchises loaded with very unique playstyles. It's one of the best things about both of these series. No matter how you play, no matter what you want to experiment with, there is a character for you. So that needs to be true for this game as well. In fact, I think this is already the most I have ever had to stop to point out how unique a character's gameplay is in an episode of Build the Roster. And that's amazing! Having unique characters is a wonderful thing. Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear are great games, everyone. We should all be playing them right now. But anyway, back to Rachel. Yes, she would be that character that focuses on setting up traps, putting obstacles all over the field. The sort of character that keeps opponents worrying about what's placed where. I mean, you're trying to focus on this tiny vampire girl, and you don't even notice the third lightning rod that she's placed behind you, and now there's a frog hopping towards you, and you don't even know what that thing is going to do. That was probably a very weird sentence for anyone not familiar with this character. And if you aren't familiar with her, yes, if the last name wasn't a dead giveaway, Rachel is a vampire. And you know what other franchise has vampire fighters? Guilty Gear. So we should probably include one. Here comes Daredevil! Oh, oopsies. One last thing. Be on the lookout for our samurai. 
He can he sense auras, auras, so I wouldn't recommend waiting it out in your hiding places. Samurai? It can't be. Nagoriyuki. Yes, as I just said, if Rachel is a shoo-in, then we should probably go ahead and include a Guilty Gear Vampire, or Nightless as they call them, which means it comes down to Slayer or Nagoriyuki. And I'm going to pick Nagoriyuki because even though I think Slayer's personality would match Rachel's better, Nago's first appearance was in Strive, the new Guilty Gear game that just came out. Heck, that wasn't just his first appearance, he was a major focus of it. He was one of these central figures in the story mode. He's the big boss at the end of arcade mode. Hell, he was even the character they showed off at the end of the reveal trailer that left everyone wondering for a year, who the heck was that guy? When are we going to see more of him? When you think of the characters that Strive was promoting, Nago Ryuki is way up there. And when you put together a crossover game, you can't just have the classic characters. No, you need the new faces. And Nago Ryuki is the big new face of Guilty Gear, so he's our man. But there's one other reason to include him. In the story mode, he is a next to unstoppable juggernaut. He is an insanely powerful fighter even in a world full of insanely powerful fighters. I wonder if there's anyone over in the world of Blaze Blue whose interest might be piqued by someone like that. The Wheel of Fate is turning! But don't sweat the details. I'm still craving your blood! You damn hunk of muscle! Don't you dare look down on me! You're gonna be dead meat! Idea engine linked! Blaze Blue, activate! Oh, excellent! So that is the Blaze Blue! I shall sink my teeth into it until I can face it no more! Azrael. I've said it over and over, but you know if Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear crossed over, they would focus a lot on the story. And if we're talking about what characters would be great to throw into the story, Azrael would have to pop up. For anyone who doesn't know, Azrael is a character who is so strong, his power breaks the laws of physics, and he only has one goal, to find strong opponents so that they can sate his bloodlust. This guy only cares about combat, and that's it. And I'll be honest with you, he was not originally going to make it onto this list. I know he's popular and big and tough, but I wanted to include maybe one or more obscure Blaze Blue characters, put a wild card in there just to surprise people. But when I was going through the Guilty Gear Strive story mode and Nago Ryuki popped up, this insane immortal powerhouse who had a sword that could even kill an immortal, my mind immediately went to Azrael. These two have to meet. That unstoppable force has to meet this immovable object. Heck, have Nago Ryuki and Soul meet up, it looks like they're going to fight, then Azrael just crashes down and challenges both of them at once. A scene like that justifies him being in here all by itself. So there you go, the final Blaze Blue character, someone that fits into the story perfectly. But again, I don't want everyone to just be here for story purposes, so that's why the last Guilty Gear character is here 100% for the fans. Here comes Daredevil! Biken. When it came time to choose the final character, it came down to two choices for me. Biken and Johnny. Both of these characters are super popular. In fact, as I speak, they're both topping the charts as the two most requested characters for DLC for Strive, and both of them, despite being so popular, have kind of been absent from the Guilty Gear saga recently. I mean, Johnny did get added to Exard Rev, but that's only after he was absent from the game right before it, Exard Sign. And Biken was out of both Exard Sign and Exard Rev, and it wasn't until Exard Rev 2 that she got added as DLC. And yes, I am aware of how confusing these names are. God forbid we just make Guilty Gear 2. Oh wait, they did make Guilty Gear 2. And it was kind of bad. All right, never mind. carry on with your crazy naming scheme. So these are two popular characters that fans want more, but it didn't feel right to include both of them since I wanted to include a wide variety of characters, and while Biken and Johnny are indeed very different characters, they're both sword fighters. And this roster already has a lot of sword fighters. What is this? 
Smash Bros? Uh, I made the joke for you. So, in the interest of creating the most variety possible, I had to pick one, and in the end I chose... Neither. Yeah, I'll admit I couldn't decide, so I went on Twitter and asked everyone who they would want in a game if they could only pick one, and Biken won with a rather impressive lead. So, when I say she's here because she's a fan favorite, I've actually got evidence to back that up. And there you have it, your 26 carriage ready to rock, Rebel 1, action, all those crazy Arxis catchphrases. Azrael, Biken, Bang Shishigami, Celica Mercury, Chip Zanif, Dizzy, Faust, Hakuman, Hazuma, Ino, Iron Tager, Jin Kisaragi, Kai Kisk, Makoto Nanaya, Mei, Nagoriyuki, Nine the Phantom, Noel Vermillion, New 13, Potemkin, Rachel Alucard, Ragnar the Blood Edge, Ramlethal Valentine, Soul Bad Guy Testament, and Zato One. That has to be the wildest collection of names I have ever had to read off on this show. Now, I feel like this roster provides us with most of the staple, a decent spread of characters from over several installments throughout the years, and a handful of surprise picks to keep it interesting, all of whom would play well together in whatever big crazy story these two would create because you know there would be one. But most importantly, as I have said many times over, Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear are two series defined by the huge variety in playstyles among their characters, and I think we have captured a veritable smorgasbord of variety here today. However, there's still so many great characters that we could have used. And it feels like having to hit so many different check marks while putting this roster together and having to worry about what characters would match up well, it really did limit some of the characters that we could use and you already know where I'm going with this, don't you? Yeah, it's where we find game B without at least one season of DLC, especially a crossover game. The whole purpose of a crossover game is fan service. It's what characters do people want to see go up against each other. It's the ultimate answer to the question, who would win in a fight? Which means that even if we doubled our starting roster, there would still be characters people would be upset weren't included. And luckily, since we got the basics and the characters important for any story-related purposes out of the way, that means we can now focus on characters solely here for the fans. Characters that are here just to be fun. I figure six characters is a pretty standard number for a season of DLC, and it's a nice and even number which works for a crossover game. So let's see who will be the first character to enter the arena. Hibiki Kohaku. For the first DLC character, you need someone that will get people talking. Someone that will bring in the fans who weren't satisfied with the main roster. And in 2018, for the 10 year anniversary of the series, the Blaze Blue staff held a poll to find out the most popular characters, and Hibiki Kohaku came in at number 3, despite the fact he had only been in two games and was only playable in one of them. Why is he so popular? Is it because he can teleport and attack with crows all across the screen and has crazy air combos giving him massive maneuverability? Is it because he's basically an Attack on Titan character? Is it because of the bowl cut? I don't know. I honestly have no idea why fans love him as much as they do. Seriously, it's a mystery to me. But they do, and if you want your first DLC character to be one that makes audiences perk up, adding the third most popular character in the series would certainly do that. Also, as I mentioned before, Blaze Blue did already have their own crossover game in Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, and that game brought in a ton of characters from Blaze Blue, but Hibiki never made it in. So, if we put him in this game, it would help to differentiate the cast of this game from the last one, and if he really is as popular as the poll says, then I'm sure his fans have been waiting for his return. Here comes Daredevil! Jam Karateberry. Jam has for a long time now been that character who fans love, but sadly, there's always just enough other characters in front of her to keep her from getting into the main roster. She wasn't an Xard sign, but she was able to return in the follow up Xard Rev. 
And at the moment, she still isn't in Strive, but they have held polls in Japan, North America, Europe, and Asia asking what characters people want to see return. And she was in the top 10 for all four areas. So it kind of fits that she would be DLC in this game as well. And in all honesty, she kind of works better as DLC. As I kept pointing out over and over again, you know there'd be a big crazy story mode all about worlds coming together and blah 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 blah. And there are a lot of characters who would work well in a story like that. A lot of characters who fit the high stakes dramatic saying of these realities clashing together. Jam isn't one of them. Jam's entire story has always been, my restaurant is broke and I need money. That is a ton of fun. It's one of the things that makes Jam so incredibly charming. But it's not the kind of quest that ties into the overall plot of realities colliding together. So let's save the spunky martial arts chef for DLC where she can just have fun and not get too bogged down with all the serious lore and edgy sword boy action. Also, I think she works great in this hypothetical playstyle because part of Jam's ability is that she can charge up her key for extra damage, so maybe just map her charge ability to the drive button or make her drive ability something that has a different effect based on how much you've charged her up. This new drive power would play into her key abilities perfectly. The wheel of fate is turning. Bullet. We need a few surprises in here, a few characters that people definitely weren't expecting, but they're still fun choices. And I think Bullet is one of those characters that fits right into that sweet spot. Is she one of the big faces of Blaze Blue? Not exactly. She's never really been one of those characters that people picture when they think of the prime cast of this franchise, which would keep her from getting into the main roster. However, in terms of personality, in terms of design, and in terms of gameplay, yeah, she's got lots of fans. She's got that rough and tumble attitude which matches her combat as she uses gun gloves and she almost plays like a cross between a rushdown and a grappler which can make her both a good entry level character while having enough depth and variety to her that I've seen professional players do crazy stuff with her. But most importantly, I don't think anyone would expect her. And you need that one character in your DL season that takes fans completely by surprise, while at the same time, leaving them happy that they made it in. Here comes Daredevil! Hmm? Who are you? I'm a Secret Service agent, can't you tell? Giovanna! From one badass special agent to another, I'm bringing Giovanna in as DLC because she is one of the two big new characters that were introduced in Strive, and when you release a crossover game around the same time as your latest mainline installment, you do want to include some of your new additions in order to create some synergy between the two. Oh, I really like this new character. Oh, they're in this crossover game too? I'll check that out. Oh, I really like this Guilty Gear character in this crossover game. What's that? Their first appearance was in the newest game that is out now? I'll check that out then. See how that works? That was one of the reasons for putting Nagaryuki in the main roster, so now we can use Giovanna to do that for the DLC. Also, I've seen a ton of people playing her online, so clearly she has struck a chord with audiences, and I'd love to see what her drive ability could be, because she's got a spirit dog that is connected to her, but the dog doesn't really do much outside of giving her animation some flair. So, give her a drive ability that acts as a special attack specifically for the dog to help flesh it out and make it more than just the world's coolest accessory. The Wheel of Fate is turning! Suzano. I wanted to include another villain in the DLC, and that pretty much meant another version of Yuki Teremi. Told you this got all Kingdom Heartsy. Wait, when did the plot of Kingdom Hearts start to get really complicated? Oh my god, did Kingdom Hearts actually get all blaze bluey? My brain hurts. 
Anyway, back to the video. Suzu no O was the ultimate form of Yuki Teremi that appeared in the final game, and I'm going with him because if you want a villain, this guy just screams big baddie. He is a giant beast overflowing with darkness and neon green evil. And when it comes to his playstyle, he has incredibly strong attacks, but they're all locked away and you have to unlock these moves one by one every single round before you can use them. So despite his unga bunga appearance, he actually requires a ton of strategy. But the most important reason why I'm including him is because he is our final Blaze Blue DLC character. And while I'm not worrying too much about who matches up with who anymore, he does actually match up very well with our final Guilty Gear character. Here comes Daredevil! Justice. Yes, from the big final villain of Blaze Blue to the big original villain of Guilty Gear, I'm choosing Justice, the gear that led the war against man for a hundred years. This giant mechanized monster has remained one of the more iconic characters for Guilty Gear, but because as I have said probably, I don't know, a thousand times now, yeah, let's go with that. But because this is a series that cares a lot about the story, there is no way that she can ever really come back. She has been defeated for good. She is done. However, this is a crossover game, meaning we don't really need to worry about continuity too much. And even then, this is the DLC for the crossover game. So that means that continuity is thrown completely out the window. Worrying about who is alive or who is dead and who existed at the same time as someone else is something that is never even going to cross our radar when talking about DLC for this game. We are now in Funland, where the number one question is, would it be cool to include them? And for Justice, the answer is yes. It's a big yes. And considering that this is the only way that we could possibly ever see Justice again, then why wouldn't we take it? Plus, look at Justice. Now look at Susanoo. Now back to Justice. Now back to Susanoo. You want to talk about two boss characters from these series who feel like they were destined to clash? It's them. They could destroy planets just arguing over who has the best shoulder pads. But there you have it, the complete starting roster as well as the first season of DLC. But believe me, if this game was a success, then we could easily keep going because neither of these franchises have any lack of great characters to choose from. I could seriously do a second season of DLC if I wanted to. I'm not going to do that though because then we would be here all day if I kept going. My Natsumi, Leo Whitefang, Tsubaki Yayoi, Jacko Valentine, Naoto Kurogani, and Order Soul. There! That is all that you're gaining from me because we seriously do need to wrap this up by now. So, now that Guilty Gear is currently exploding and the world is talking about all things Arc Systems, could we get another Blaze Blue or maybe even a crossover between the two? Who knows? Probably not that second one, but hey, it's fun to pretend. So do me a favor and pretend like you get to build this roster and let me know who you would want to see down below. Also, if you like this video, then share it around the web. We really do work hard on these builder rosters, and every time I see you guys sharing them around the web, it really does make me feel like it was all worth it. And if you're new here and you still haven't done all the usual YouTube things, then make sure that you hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, give us a thumbs up, and check out all the other videos that are popping up right now. And remember, the second annual Fight for the Future charity stream is coming up, so stay tuned for more info on that, and follow me on Twitter at Thorgy's Arcade or on Twitch at Professor Thorgy for more information. Thanks again for tuning in, stay safe out there, and come back next time.